Big thanks to Squarespace for sponsoring this video. More on them later. This video is part two of a multi-part series where I tried to figure out if it's actually possible to build a real RC ground effect vehicle. So what defines an RC ground effect vehicle as real? Well, according to some commenters, all the ones you've seen so far in this video are fake, because they can fly high like a normal airplane. So by that definition, a real ground effect vehicle is one that can take off from the water and fly in the ground effect, but is incapable of flying high like a normal airplane. It is extremely difficult to achieve this, because getting up off the water takes a ton of power. And if your craft has enough power to do that, then it almost definitely has enough power to fly like a normal plane. I don't necessarily agree with this definition, because I think you can call any vehicle that was designed to operate low to the ground a ground effect vehicle, regardless of how high it can fly. But either way, the point of doing all this is not to try and nail down definitions, but rather to do a deep dive on the interactions between a wing and a surface and figure out if it's really possible to design a vehicle that is entirely dependent on this phenomenon to operate. So let's get started. As I was scouring the internet to try and find an air quotes real ground effect vehicle, I rewatched the great Peter Streeple's video of his big foam board Ekranoplan, and at the end, he summed it up really well. The funny thing is actually most videos I've seen of Ekranoplans, they're either high speed airboats on YouTube videos, or they're actually just full up airplanes. I rarely see people actually flying them over the water like they're supposed to. The only video I've really seen is like RC Testify's video you should check out somewhere in the link just down below. I laughed out loud when I heard him mention my video because I had totally forgotten about this. It definitely made me feel like I had come full circle and was stuck in an infinite loop of trying to complete the same impossible task over and over again. The video that he was referring to was from 2015, and it was of this flying sled that I had initially designed for snow, but then modified for use on water. There's a few clips of it flying in ground effect really well over snow, but all the clips of it over water either show it skipping across the surface, or just flying high like an airplane. I definitely remember it being able to stay in ground effect over water, but I must not have gotten any footage of that, or maybe my memory is just terrible. But either way, I figured this would be a good design to revisit and try to optimize for ground effects. And maybe, just maybe, I could get it to take off from the water, but not have enough power to fly high, and therefore be the world's first, air quotes, real RC ground effect vehicle. So let's start the build. I just kind of eyeballed all the proportions and made it a bit bigger than the original flying sled. This version has a 38 inch wingspan and is 30 inches long. It's all made out of 6mm Depron. It's a six channel plane, so it has elevons, a rudder, differential thrust, and motor tilt. What really sets this one apart from the original flying sled is par thrust. This is where the motors tilt up and blow air under the wing and create a kind of hovercraft effect to help get it up off the water. Then once it's up, the motors will pivot down for normal flight. Par thrust stands for power augmented ram, and it's how big giant ekranoplans like the Caspian Sea Monster got up off the water. So for the first flight, I came out to the park to tune the flight controller. I'm running ArduPilot, but it's only really for flight stabilization. There's no GPS or rangefinder connected. Now you might be thinking, wait, I thought you were going to make a real ground effect vehicle that couldn't fly. So my plan is to reduce the power of the motors by limiting the maximum PWM signal that the flight controller sends to the motors, and hope that it will then just barely have enough power to get off the water, but not enough power to fly high. Wow! If that sounds like cheating to you, I'd say take any ground effect vehicle, Rip out all the unnecessary weight and give it bigger engines, and there's no chance it won't fly. Except for maybe the airfoil flare boat. That probably can't fly for a few reasons I'll get into later. But for vehicles like the Caspian Sea Monster, I think they could probably definitely fly if you just increase the thrust to weight ratio. I mean, Peter's flew, right? In the previous video in this series, I laid out a whole argument about how the Caspian Sea Monster probably was totally capable of exiting ground effect. You can go back and watch that if you care. But anyways, even on grass, this new flying sled was looking promising. I was already feeling ground effect a little bit, and pivoting the motors up seemed to work great. <laughs> so now let's head to the lake for the first water test. Pretty much immediately, it was clear that the natural ground effect feedback loop was strong with this one. With the right throttle setting, it would just hug the ground and stay within a few inches of the surface. At this point, I did not have the power attenuated at all, so I could still fly like an airplane. Some people say the ground effect is caused by the wingtip vortexes getting squashed up against the ground, and others say it's from a pocket of high pressure air getting trapped in between the wing and the ground. I'm starting to think that the high pressure air pocket is the dominant effect we're seeing here, at least for designs like this with a big thick wing cord. This is probably the best ground effect vehicle design I've created so far. I definitely arrived at this design by just modifying my original flying sled, but it turns out this design is actually pretty similar to a pre-existing ground effect vehicle design called the Bixel. Here are a few other Bixel models from YouTube. They all seem to work pretty well. So with the motors in the flat position for no par thrust, 
the aircraft could still take off from the water very easily, as you can see here. <laughs> Tilting the motors up closer to a 35 degree angle definitely helped though. It made the amount of power required to lift off quite a bit lower, which is very promising for our mission to make a real ground effects vehicle. You just have to be careful, because having the motors tilted up definitely makes the nose want to pitch up if you don't give it enough down elevator. Pitch stabilization on the flight controller helps a lot with this. With the motors tilted up even more, at like 50 or 60 degrees, it would definitely just flip over if I gave it too much throttle. But using just the right amount of throttle and a lot of down elevator would make it hovercraft around really well. Wow! And at times, even fly without contacting the water. Look at that! Look at that! It was totally flying! With the motors in this position, there was no way it would build up enough airspeed to actually fly. That's flying right there. That's... There was no contact with the water for a second. That's not really flying though, that's just hovercrafting. Oh, oh. So it seemed like the best move was to start with the motors up at about 30 degrees, and then tilt them down to the forward position right as the aircraft breaks contact with the water. So the next day I set out to do my real ground effects vehicle tests. Through Mission Planner, I reduced the maximum motor PWM by more than half. So even when I would give it full throttle on the oh, remote controller, it would only have a fraction of its original power. Then I would try to take off both with the motors in the forward position and again with them tilted up at 30 degrees. Okay, there we took off a little bit. There we go, there we go, there we go. Woohoo, we're flying! That test proved that having the motors up at 30 degrees made it possible to get off the water with an amount of throttle that was too little to get off the water with the motors tilted down. Pretty interesting. So I tested a bunch of different max PWM values, and on some flights I would be able to climb up out of ground effect, and on others it wouldn't. Seemingly randomly. It was probably dependent on how much water drops were stuck to the plane, and what the breeze was doing. How is that thing real? <laughs> it's so cute! Also, as the battery voltage dropped, it would get less powerful, which made it difficult to find the perfect ground effect PWM value. That's not a ground effect vehicle, that's just a... RC plane flying low. It's very lethargic though, I cannot climb hardly at all. Fly, come on. Get up, get up, get up. There we go, motor's up. Woo -hoo -hoo -hoo. Okay, fresh battery, 1480 PWM. Let's try and fly this thing. Oh, fresh battery makes a big difference, I think. Huh? It's not going up. That's about as high as I can go so far. Okay, I just put the motors in the flat position. Ah, oh, are we getting pretty high? No, it's sinking back down. I don't know, I'm not really able to climb at all. And I'm back on the water. I couldn't, couldn't do the turn. It sank too much. I'm dead in the water again. Why did it shut off? Despite the flight controller being conformal coated, it still managed to get some drops of water on it and start malfunctioning. That guy is going towards it. I think he might rescue it for me. No, he just turned. Shit. Ah, this thing is so far away. It's been blowing downwind. Ugh. Okay, we're getting really close. Oh, you get back here. You bad ground effect vehicle. This is crazy. It's just going at like full power with no command. I have no idea why it's doing that. Okay, got it, we're heading back. So the flight controller is conformal coated. The Dragon Link receiver here is completely coated in hot glue. My suspicion is that the conformal coating doesn't actually work. I've had plenty of electronics that are conformal coated still get water damage. Not damage, but like water still affects them. Or maybe you just need to do a lot of layers because right here I only have one layer of conformal coating on there. Maybe I'll put another two layers on there or something. So the next day I did a lot more testing various maximum PWM values. And annoyingly it was still very dependent on the slight amount of breeze and other factors. It did, however, become clear that it's definitely possible to find a maximum PWM that would allow it to get off the water but not climb any higher than a few feet in altitude. The water conditions and breeze on this day definitely didn't make it easy, though. Come on, buddy. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. It's up, it's up. Oh, it just doesn't have enough power to stay, stay flying, which is kind of the whole point here. <laughs> Build up airspeed, transition to front motors. Oh yeah, just in time. We're cruising. Can it fly? Oh, oh, 
Oh, it's sinking down. Later on, I put the Insta360 GO 2 camera on the motor mount so that we could get a close-up view of the water contacting the floats and the motor angles. Here we start with the motors tilted up at a 30 degree angle, and then right as it breaks contact with the water, they tilt down flat. It works really well. The next day I headed to a different lake with super smooth water and no wind. You know it's calm when the biggest source of disturbance is a bunch of geese flapping their wings. I'm pretty sure they were doing this on purpose just to mess with me. Silly gooses. With these calm conditions, it was super easy to stay in ground effect. I mean, just look at how buttery smooth it is. It's so smooth that it even gets kind of boring. In this shot here, it looks like the aircraft is touching the water because of the wake. But that wake is actually entirely from the downwash. It was fully airborne this entire time. Whew! That was it. That was a good one. Here you can see how the aircraft will sometimes even get into a little ground effect oscillation and kind of bounce up and down on the cushion of air. The calm water made taking off require less power, so for this reason it was easier to find a max motor PWM value that allowed us to take off but not fly high. That was a seamless transition. So as long as I was using par thrust to break contact with the water, and then transitioning the motors forward, this was definitely fitting the description of being an, air quotes, real ground effect vehicle. Static. It's too good. It's so good. With no wind, it works so good. So well, sorry. So this settles it for once and for all. RC ground effect vehicles are possible. It's just really hard to find the exact threshold of power that prevents you from taking off. And it's also really impractical. Right after I proved it was possible, I immediately increased the max PWM back up to the highest level because who doesn't want more power? Having the extra power is super nice if you suddenly need to pop up over an obstacle or just do a sharper turn. I'm sure there will be some people that say this still isn't a real ground effect vehicle because it only can't fly like an airplane when the power is artificially capped, but the fact of the matter is you're always going to be able to give a vehicle a little extra power somehow. So power seems like a lousy qualifier for what makes a real ground effect vehicle. Now, maybe it's possible to make an even realer ground effect vehicle that is even aerodynamically unstable out of ground effect and simply can't fly, but at the moment I feel like that's pretty insanely difficult, especially if that design doesn't use permanent par thrust. The ground effect just really isn't that strong of a force, at least not at the RC scale. So in order for an aircraft's aerodynamic stability to be dependent on it, the aircraft would already have to be pretty borderline unstable. But with that being said, I do plan on attempting this at some point. Another little bit of food for thought is that so far I've just mostly been experimenting with these ultra lightweight foam vehicles. A completely different approach to the whole ground effect vehicle thing would be to start with a heavier and more powerful vehicle, and then add weight until it can no longer fly out of ground effect. This idea is super interesting to me and I'd like to mess around with it in the future, but for now my next few videos are sticking with the lightweight foam stuff. There were some comments on my previous video saying I had completely missed the practical point of ground effect, which is to improve an aircraft's efficiency, payload capability, and reduce its induced drag, and that I was wasting my time trying to determine if it was possible to build an, air quotes, real ground effect vehicle. To this I would say, the benefits of ground effect are already well understood, and I've spent quite a bit of time toying around with that stuff. Now my interest has surpassed that and I'm focusing on more nuanced questions of how an aircraft interacts with the ground, such as the one I answered in this video. It doesn't necessarily have to be practical here people, we're just making YouTube videos. Now to some people's delight and others dismay, here's another Colin Fox original. There's a link to the full album in the description. Ground effect in all electric And you're whipping in the shape like a dominatrix Haters hating on this form I'm shaping What my plans do is be elevating Maybe elevating Maybe elevating In my next video, I'm going to be revisiting the tandem wing airfoil flare boat design because I really butchered it in the last video. So stay tuned for that and don't forget to subscribe. Guess what I'm stoked about? I'll show you. It's this right here. You see that? See how many boxes are left here? 
Yeah, it might look like a lot, but it's actually not a lot compared to what it used to look like. This whole room was filled with boxes at one point. It was like the Great Wall of Snowcat tracks. So all the Snowcat kits have shipped. Um, so whoever bought a Snowcat kit from the second batch, it's now gone. So thanks to everyone who bought one. It's super nice to get all those out of here. And I wouldn't have been able to do it without the sponsor of today's video, Squarespace. Customers can buy the Snowcat kit off my Squarespace website, and then the order shows up in the orders page where I can see which ones have been fulfilled or not. All the inventory is automatically kept track of, and I can easily add or remove stock to match exactly what we have crammed into the basement. Then once it's time to ship, we use the Squarespace extension for ShipStation. That makes it super easy to purchase and print all the shipping labels. And after that, UPS comes and picks up all the boxes. Now Squarespace has new features that allows you to connect with your audience and generate revenue through gated, members-only content. Manage your members, send email communications, and leverage audience insights, all in one easy-to-use platform. Create a community on your Squarespace website with a fully integrated commenting system that supports threaded comments, replies, and likes. Use their powerful blogging tools to categorize, share, and schedule your posts, too. Go to squarespace.com for your free trial, and when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com slash rctestflight to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain.